Game of Thrones, Book 1, A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin. This is Catelyn's point of view chapter. We will make King's Landing within the hour. Catelyn turned away from the rail and forced herself to smile. Your oarmen have done well by us, Captain. Each one of them shall have a silver stag as a token of my gratitude. Captain Morrie Tumnus favored her with a half bow. You are far too generous, Lady Stark. The honor of carrying a great lady like yourself is all the reward they need, but they'll take the silver anyway. Moroe smiled, as you say. He spoke the common tongue fluently, with only the slightest hint of Tyroshi accent. He had been plying the narrow sea for thirty years, he had told her, as oarman, quartermaster, and finally captain of his own trading galleys. The storm dancer was his fourth ship, and his fastest a two-masted galley of sixty oars. She had certainly been the fastest of the ships available in White Harbor when Catelyn and Sir Roderick Castle had arrived there after a headlong gallop down river. The Tyroshi were notorious for their avarice, and Sir Roderick had argued for hiring a fishing sloop out of the three sisters. But Catelyn had insisted on the galley. It was good that she did. The winds were against them much of the voyage, and without the galley's oars, They'd still be bearing their way past the fingers, instead of skimming toward the king's landing on journey's end. So close, she thought. Beneath the linen bandages, her fingers still throbbed where the dagger had bitten. The pain was her scourge, Catelyn felt, least her forget. She could not bend the last two fingers on her left hand, and the others would never again be dexterous. Yet that was small enough price to pay for Bran's life. Sir Roderick chose that moment to appear on deck. My good friend, said Moroe through his forked green beard, the Tyroshi loved bright colors, even in their facial hair. It is so fine to see you looking better. Yes, Sir Roderick agreed. I haven't wanted to die in almost two days now. He bowed to Catelyn. My lady, he was looking better, a shade thinner than he had been when they set out from the White Harbor, but almost himself again. The strong winds of the bite and the roughness of the narrow sea had not agreed with them and he had almost gone over the side when the storm seized them unexpectedly off Dragonstone. Yet somehow he had clung to the rope until three of Moroi's men could rescue him and carry him safely below the decks. The captain was just telling me that our voyage is almost at an end, she said. Sir Roderick managed a wry smile. So soon? He looked odd without his great white side whiskers, smaller somehow, less fierce, and ten years older. Yet, back on the bite, it had seemed prudent to submit to the crewman's razor after his whiskers had become hopelessly befouled by the third time while he leaned over the rail and wretched into the swirling winds. I will leave you to discuss your business, Captain Murray said. He bowed and took his leave of them. The galley skimmed through the water like a dragonfly, the oars rising and falling at perfect time. Sir Roderick held the rail and looked over at the passing shore. I have not been the most foul of protectors. Catelyn touched his arm. We are here, Sir Roderick, and safely, and that is all that truly matters. Her hand groped beneath her cloak, her fingers stiff and fumbling. The dagger was still at her side. She found that she had to touch it now and again to reassure herself. Now we must reach the king's master at arms and pray that he can be trusted. Sir Aaron Sintagar is a vain man, but an honest one. Sir Roderick's hand went to his face to stroke his whiskers, and discovered once again that they were gone. He looked non-phased. He may know the blade, yes, but my lady, the moment we go to shore we are at risk, and there are those at court who will know you in sight. Catelyn's mouth grew tight, the little finger. His face swam up before her, a boy's face, though he was a boy no longer. His father had died several years before, so he was Lord Baelish now. Yet they still called him Littlefinger. Her brother Edmure had given him that name long ago at Riverrun. His family's modest holdings were on the smallest of the fingers, and Peter had been slight and short for his age. Sir Roderick cleared his throat. Lord Baelish once, uh, he thought trailed off uncertainly in search of the polite word. Catelyn was past delicacy. He was my father's ward. We grew up together in Riverrun. I thought of him as a brother, but his feelings for me were more than brotherly. When it was announced that I was to wed Brandon Stark, Peter challenged for the right of my hand. It was madness. Brandon was twenty, 
Peter's scarcely fifteen. I had to beg Brandon to spare Peter's life. He led him off with a scar. Afterward, my father sent him away. I have not seen him since. She lifted her face to the spray, as if the brisk wind could blow the memories away. He wrote to me at Riverwind after Brandon was killed, but I had burned the letter unread. By then I knew that Ned would marry me in his brother's place. Sir Roderick's fingers fumbled once again for the non-existent whiskers. Littlefinger sits on the small council now. I knew he would rise high, Catelyn said. He was always clever, even as a boy, but it's one thing to be clever and another to be wise. I wonder what the years have done to him. High overhead, the far eyes sang out from their rigging. Captain Roy came scrambling across the deck, giving orders, and all around them the storm dancer burst into frantic activity as King Landing slid into view atop its three high hills. Three hundred years ago, Catelyn knew, those heights had been covered with forests, and only a handful of fisherfolk had lived on the north shore of that black water rush where that deep, swift rivers flowed into the sea. Then Aegon the Conqueror had sailed from Dragonstone. It is there where his army had put ashore, and there on the highest hill that he built the first crude redoubt of wood and earth. Now the city covered the shore as far as Catelyn could see. Manses and arbors and greeneries, brick storehouses and timbered inns and merchant stalls, taverns and graveyards and brothels, all piled one on another. She could hear the clamor of the fish market, even at this distance. Between the buildings were broad roads lined with trees, wandering crookback streets, alleys so narrow that two men could not walk abreast. Visenya's hill was crowned by the great sept of Baylor and its seven crystal towers. Across the city on the hill of Rennie stood the blackened walls of the dragon pit, its huge dome collapsed on ruin, its bronze doors closed now for a century. The streets of the sisters ran between them, straight as an arrow. The city walls rose in the distance, high and strong. A hundred quays lined the waterfront, and the harbor was crowded with ships. Deep water fishing boats and river runners came and went. Ferrymen pulled back and forth across the Blackwater Rush, trading galleys, unloaded goods from Bravos and Pentos and Lice. Catelyn spied the Queen's ornate barge, tied up beside a fat-bellied whaler with the port of a bend, its hull black with tar, while upriver a dozen lean golden warships rested in their cribs, sails furled and cruel iron rams lapping in the water. And above it all, frowning down from Aegon's high hill, was the Red Keep. Seven huge drum towers crowned with iron ramparts and immense grim barbarican vaulted halls and covered bridges, barracks and dungeons and granaries, massive curtain walls studded with archer nests, all fashioned of pale red stone. Aegon the Conqueror had commanded it built. His son Magor the Cruel had seen it completed. Afterwards, he had taken the heads of every stonemason, woodworker, and builder who had labored on it. Only the blood of the dragon would ever know the secrets of the fortress the dragon lords had built, he vowed. Yet now the banners that flow from its battlements were golden, not black, and where three-headed dragon had once breathed fire, now pranced the crowned stag of House Baratheon. A high message swan ship from the summer isles was beating out from the port, its white sails huge with wind. The storm dancer moved past it, pulling stealthy for shore. My lady, Sir Roderick said, I have thought of how best to proceed while I lay abed. You must not enter the castle. I will go on your steed and bring Sir Oran to you in your some safe place. She studied the old knight as the galley drew near to the pier. Maria was shouting in a vulgar valerian of the free cities. You'd be as much at risk as I would, Sir Roderick smiled. I think not. I look as my reflection in the water earlier and scarcely recognize myself. My mother was the last person to see me without whiskers, and she is forty years dead. I believe I'm safe enough, my lady. Maria bellowed a command. As one, sixty yards lifted from the river, then reversed and backed water. The galley slowed. Another shout, the oars slipped back inside the hole. As they thumped against the deck, Tarashi seamen down to tie up. 
Murillo came bursting up, all smiles. King's Landing, my lady, as you did command, and never has a ship made a swifter or surer passage. Will you be needing assistance to carry your things to the castle? We shall not be going to the castle. Perhaps you can suggest an inn, some place clean and comfortable, and not too far from the river. The Tairoshi fingered his forked green beard. Just so, I know of several establishments that might suit your needs. Yet first, if I may be so bold, there is the matter of the second half of the payment we agreed upon, and, of course, the extra silver you are so kind of promised the sixty stags. I believe it was. For the oarman, Catelyn reminded him. Oh, of certain, said Morio. Though perhaps I should hold on to them for now until we return to Tyrosh, for the sake of their wives and their children. If you give them the silver here, my lady, they will dice it away or spend it all in a night's pleasure. There are worse things to spend money on, Sir Roderick put in. Winter is coming. A man must make his own choices, Catelyn said. They earned the silver. How they spend it is no concern of mine. As you say, my lady, Morio replied, howling a smile. Just to be sure, Catelyn paid the ornament herself. A staff to each man, and a copper to the two men who carried their chest halfway up Vicenius Hill, to the end that Morio had suggested. It was a rambling old place of Ill Alley. The woman who owned it was a sour crone with a wandering eye who looked them over suspiciously and bit the coin that Catelyn offered her to make sure it was real. Her rooms were large and airy, though, and Morio swore that the fish stew was the best savory in all the Seven Kingdoms. Best of all, she had no interest in their names. I think it is best that you stay away from the common room, Sir Roderick said, after they had settled in. Even a place like this, one never knows who may be watching. He wore a ring mail dagger and a long sword under a dark cloak with a hood. He pulled up over his head. I'll be back before nightfall with Sir Arryn, he promised. Rest now, my lady. Catelyn was tired. The voyage had been long and fatiguing, and she was no longer as young as she had been. Her windows opened on the alley and the rooftops, with a view of the black water beyond. She watched Sir Roderick set off striding briskly through the busy streets until he was lost in the crowds and decided to take his advice. The bedding was stuffed with straw instead of feathers, but she had no trouble falling asleep. She woke to the pounding on her door. Catelyn sat up sharply. Outside the window, the rooftops of King Landing were red in the light of setting sun. She had slept longer than she intended. A fist hammered on her door again, and the voice called out, "'Open in the name of the King!' A moment, she called out. She wrapped herself in her cloak. The dagger was on the bedside table. She snatched it up before she unlatched the heavy wooden door. The men who pushed into the room wore the black ring mail and the golden cloaks of the city watch. Their leader smiled at the dagger in her hand and said, No need for that, milady. We're to escort you to the castle. By whose authority, she said. He showed her a ribbon. Catelyn felt her breath catch in her throat. The seal was a mockingbird in gray wax. Peter, she said. So soon? Something must have happened to Sir Roderick. She looked at the head guardsman. Do you know who I am? No, my lady, he said. My lord's little finger said only to bring you to him and see that you were not mistreated. Catelyn nodded. You may wait outside while I dress. She bathed their hands in the basin and wrapped them in clean linen. Her fingers were thick and awkward as she struggled to lace up her bodice and not a drab of brown cloak around her neck. How could Littlefinger have known she was here? Sir Droderick would never have told him. Old he might be, but he was stubborn and loyal to a fault. Were they too late? Had the Lannisters reached King's Landing before her? No, if that were true, Ned would have been here too. And surely he would have come to her. How? Then she thought, Morio. The Tarashi knew who they were and where they were. Damn him! She hoped he had gotten a good price for this information. They had brought a horse for her. The lamps were being lit along the streets as they set out, but Catelyn felt the eyes of the city on her as she rode, surrounded by the guard in their golden cloaks. When they reached the Red Keep, the portcullises were down and the great gates sealed for the night, but the castle windows were alive with flickering lights. The guardsmen left their mounts outside the walls and escorted her through the narrow postern door, then up the endless steps to the tower. 
He was alone in the room, seated at a heavy wooden table, an oil lamp beside him as he wrote. When they ushered her inside, he sat down his pen and looked at her. Cat, he said quietly. Why have I been brought here in this fashion? He rose and gestured brusquely to the guards. Leave us. The men departed. You are not mistreated, I trust, he said after they had gone. I gave firm instructions. He noticed her bandages. Her hands. Catelyn ignored the implied question. I'm not accustomed to being summoned like a serving wench, she said icily. As a boy, you still know the meaning of courtesy. I've angered you, my lady. That was never my intentions. He looked contrite. The look brought back vivid memories for Catelyn. He had been a sly child, but after his mischiefs he always looked contrite. It was a gift he had. The years had not changed him much. Peter had been a small boy, and he had grown into a small man, an inch or two shorter than Catelyn, slender and quick, with the sharp features she remembered, and the, the same laughing green-gray eyes. He had a little pointed chin beard now, and threads of silver in his dark hair, though he was still shy of thirty. They went well with the silver mockingbird on the fastened to his cloak. Even as a child, he had always loved his silver. How did you know I was in the city? she asked him. Lord Varys knows all, Peter said with a sly smile. He'll be joining us shortly, but I wanted to see you alone first. It's been too long, Cat. How many years? Catelyn ignored his familiarity. There was more than important questions. So it was the King Spider who found me. Littlefinger went. You don't want to call him that. He's very sensitive. Comes of being a eunuch, I imagine. Nothing happens in the city without Varys knowing. Oftentimes he knows about it before it happens. He has informants everywhere. His little birds, he calls them. One of his little birds heard about your visit. Thankfully, Varys came to me first. Why you? He shrugged. Why not me? I'm the master of coin, the king's own counselor. Selmy and Lord Rinley rode north to meet Robert, and Lord Stannis has gone to Dragonstone, leaving only Maester Pycelle and me. I was the obvious choice. I was ever a friend to your sister, Lysa. Varys knows that. Does Varys know about... Lord Varys knows everything, except why you are here. He lifted an eyebrow. Why are you here? A wife is allowed to yearn for her husband, and if a mother needs her daughter's clothes, who can tell her no? Littlefinger laughed. Oh, very good, my lady, but please don't expect me to believe that. I know you too well. What are the Tully's words again? Her throat was dry. Family, duty, honor. She recited stiffly. He did know her too well. Family, duty, honor, he echoed, all of which require you to remain in Winterfell, where our hand left you. No, my lady, something has happened. This sudden trip of yours bespeaks a certain urgency. I beg of you, let me help. Old sweet friends should never hesitate to rely upon each other. There was a soft knock on the door. Enter, Letterfinger called out. The man who stepped through the door was plump, perfumed, powdered, and as hairless as an egg. He wore a vest of woven gold threads over a loose gown of purple silk, and his feet were pointed slippers of soft velvet. Lady Stark, he said, taking her hand in both of his. To see you again after so many years is such a joy. His flesh was soft and moist, and his breath smelled of lilacs. Oh, your poor hands! Have you burned yourself, sweet lady? The fingers are so delicate. Our good Maester Pycelle makes a marvelous solve. Shall I send for a jar? Catelyn slid her fingers from his grasp. I thank you, my lord, but my own Maester Lewin has already seen my hurts. Ferris bobbed his head. I was grievous sad to hear about your son, and him so young. The gods are cruel. On that we agree, Lord Varys, she said. The title was but a curse. The title was but a courtesy due to him as a council member. Varys was a lord of nothing but the spider web, the master of none but his whispers. The eunuch spread his soft hands. On more than that, I hope, sweet lady, I have great esteem for your husband, our new hand, and I know we both do love King Robert. Yes, she said, forced to say, for certainly. Never has a king been so beloved as our Robert quipped little finger. He smiled shyly. At least in Lord Varys here. Good lady, Varys said with great solicitude. There are men in the free cities with wondrous healing powers. Say only the word and I will send for one of your dear Bran. Maester Lewin is doing all that he can for Bran, she told him. She would not speak of Bran, not here, 
Not with these men. She trusted Littlefinger only a little, embarrassed not at all. She would not let them see her grief. Lord Baelish tells me that I have you to think to bring me here. Varys giggled like a little girl. Oh, yes, I suppose I am guilty. I hope you forgive me, kind lady. He eased himself down into his seat and put his hands together. I wonder if we might trouble you to show us the dagger. Catelyn Stark stared at the eunuch in stunned disbelief. He was a spider, she thought wildly, an enchanter or worse. He knew things no one else could possibly know. Unless... What have you done to Sir Roderick? she demanded. Littlefinger was lost. I feel rather like a knight who arrives at the battle without his lance. What dagger are you talking about? Who is Sir Roderick? Sir Roderick Castle is the master at arms in Winterfell, Varys informed him. I assure you, Lady Stark, nothing at all has been done to the good knight. He did call here early this afternoon. He visited with Sir Aaron in the armory, and they talked about a certain dagger, about sunset. They left the castle together and walked to that dreadful hovel where you are staying. They are still there, drinking in the common room, waiting for your return. Sir Roderick was very distressed to find you gone. How could you know all that? The whisperings of little birds, Varys said, smiling. I know things, sweet lady. That is the nature of my service. He shrugged. You do have the dagger with you, yes? Catelyn pulled it out from beneath her cloak and threw it down on the table in front of them. Here, perhaps your little birds will whisper the name of the man it belongs to. Ferris lifted the knife with exaggerated delicacy and ran a thumb along the edge. Blood welled and he let out a squeal and dropped the dagger back on the table. Careful, Catelyn told him. It's sharp. Nothing holds an edge like Valerian still, Littlefinger said, as Varys sucked up his bleeding thumb and looked at Catelyn with sullen adomination. Littlefinger hefted the knife lightly in his hand, resting the grip. He flipped it in the air, caught it again with his other hand. Such sweet balance. You want to find the owner. Is that the reason for this visit? You have no need of Sir Aaron for that, my lady. You should have come to me. And if I had, she said, what would you have told me? I would have told you that there was only one knife like this in King's Landing. He grasped the blade between his thumb and forefinger, drew it back and over his shoulder, and threw it across the room with a practiced flick of the wrist. It stuck in the door and buried itself deep into the oak quivering. It's mine. Yours? It made no sense. Peter had not been to Winterfell. Until the tourney of Prince Joffrey's name day, he said, crossing the room and wrenched the dagger from the wood. I back Sir Jamie in the jousting along with half the court. Peter's sheepish grin made him look half at boy again. When Loras Tyrell unhorsed him, many of us became trifle poorer. Sir Jamie lost a hundred golden dragons and the queen lost an emerald pendant and I lost my knife. Her grace got the emerald back, but the winner kept the rest. Who? Catelyn demanded her mouth dry of fear. Her fingers ached as she remembered pain. The imp said Littlefinger as Lord Varys watched her face. Tyrion Lannister.